Good afternoon and welcome, welcome to another Saturday, another time that you guys have come back to share with us. I'm Dr. The Doctor in the chat room. We are so happy to have you and we thank you guys so much for coming back every Saturday. We cannot do this without you. So thank you, much obliged, as my grandmother would say. We appreciate you. Um, we want you to stay safe. And uh, that was definitely my stomach in the background. I think I probably need to eat. Like, that was so loud. I know y'all heard that. I, was like, <laughs> I didn't hear it, but I believe it, you know. And I'm shaking my head at you. Got to remind her. We want her you guys to stay safe. <laughs> Stop talking, Dr. West. We want you to stay safe. <laughs> Wear your mask, get your vaccines, get your boosters. Do what you need to do. Use those necessary precautions to stay safe. We are still in the midst of a pandemic. Like we always say, join us on 94.7 FM, or you can stream us live on wojg.com. Uh, you've already heard the co-host in the chat room, Dr. West. How are you, ma'am? <laughs> I'm doing well. I'm uh, excited to have Ms. Kimbrell back, and yeah. um, I'm doing pretty good. How are you feeling today besides hungry? <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. We are gearing up for part two. Had such a great discussion with uh, Ms. Owens on last week about our youth, our at-risk youth, and our youth that have been involved in uh, the juvenile justice system. Uh, that's an unfortunate thing to have to happen, but it is a reality. And so we are here to talk about the realities of life and those relevant topics that impact our communities and our world. Um, I, as we, we approach this show, and I know we're going to talk about, you know, families and the wraparound approach and you know, systems of care and all of that. I was listening to, uh, actually a friend of mine sent me this clip, this YouTube clip from Dick Gregory a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, one of the things that he, he brought up was we need to stop focusing on neighborhoods and start focusing on communities. And I thought that was pretty pretty profound, right? Simple but profound. You know, it's about our communities, building our communities, our communities, our communities, <laughs> building our communities and mobilizing, you know, our communities. And mm -hmm. there are so many things available, so many resources, you know, things that sometimes we, you know, we have access to, but we don't have access to because we don't know about it, right? You know, right. there's so much stuff out there, right? And so we need to do a better job, first of all, of getting all the information out. But, you know, we are a brilliant people mm. and we really need to come together and start using all of this brain power to mobilize our own communities. We really do. Just thought I'd say that. That ain't what we talk about per se, just thought I'd say it though, <laughs> because I really believe in it. I believe in us and yeah. I want to see things um, get better. Um, Ms. Owens, my friend Kim Burrell, thank you for coming back again to share another hour with us. We really, the discussion has been great on, on last week. We thank you for that. Uh, but we knew that you wanted to really hone in on the family side of it because we have to look at it all. I remember a program that I was working in, uh, you know, dealing with kids that were involved in gangs. And one of the things that I used to always say was, you know, we want to help our parents understand why, what made my child susceptible to this behavior? Mm -hmm. How did my child get here? You know, because it's not always a result of bad parenting, right? right. Kids, like I said on last week's show, kids are exposed to so many different things. We live in a world of instantaneous access now. Yeah. So, so many reasons why. And uh, I know that you are the person to talk about it. Uh, but I do want you to remind our audience of just who you are, a little bit about the role that you play, and then we'll kind of talk, you know, jump into our discussion today. Well, hello again, my beautiful doctors to doctors. Thank, <laughs> Thank you for you. inviting me. 
I am Kimberell Owens. I am the JDAI coordinator or Juvenile Detention Attorneys Initiative coordinator here at Juvenile Court. And what I do is I work with communities and community partners to see if we can create alternatives to detention, keeping those youth out of detention that we can keep out, but also keeping our community safe uh, in the, at the same time. Mm -hmm. So in essence, in a nutshell, that's what I do. Mm -hmm. And we thank you for thank doing you. what you do. We really do. We really thank mean that. Yeah. Thank you. yeah. So let's let's talk about the, the holistic side of things, you know, with our okay. kids that are involved in the juvenile justice system. Um, okay. we, we left last week with you talking about um, reentry and, mm -hmm. you know, how tough that is for some of the youth, you know, especially if they say been in for 100 days or whatever, you know. I'm sure it's tough on everybody, the families. It is. It is. Everybody. It is. And you, said, and you said something too when you started um, talking about Dick Gregory and um, the clip that you watched mm -hmm. about community. Mm -hmm. And from entry to wraparound to creating anything to uh, keep our youth out of the detention center or just um, you know creating resources, one thing that we have to understand is that it takes all of us. A lot of times we look at one, you know, agency, maybe you may look at juvenile court, you may look at law enforcement, maybe look at the school system, but we have to understand with creating reentry wraparound services and all this, it takes a community, it takes a village to build this village. Uh, we, and we are part of that village. And I think we forget that sometimes. And as you talked about uh, our youth uh, and, and helping the parents, uh, when you were talking about the gangs and, 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 and no, I don't think it has anything, I won't say it won't have anything to do with the parents, but Parenting is, 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 is not something that we can just say that it is easy, you know, or we, there's a book, yeah. on it, you, yeah. know? you know, parenting looks different for everybody, you know, mm -hmm. some parents think that, you know, what they're doing is, is great and mm -hmm. that it, it could be, you know, based off their situation. So when we when we think about trying to create um, any kind of program or even with the wraparounds, our wraparound system right now. It's, um, it's better than it's ever been. We do have so many different agencies that are assisting and coming on board and, 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 and working with the, the wraparound system. Um, and, 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 but what we don't have is the village. We have, to reach, we have to reach out farther to understand that I can't say that I wanna help uh, a child and I hadn't even asked the child what they need. A lot of times, even with us, even with us on this platform right now, we're talking and I'm talking and I'm, I really work to try to create those things. But who has to be at the table is the child or, or even if it's not the child, it needs to be a representative of that particular age group mm -hmm. to help because we cannot continue to try to build and build and build and we don't know what's necessary. I could say all day long what I think, yeah. I really think. And I could come up with some really pretty good ideas. But that idea may not help anybody or it may help one person, but we needed to help more people. So I think one big thing about all of this that we do, and I, and I just wanted to throw that out there. And I mm -hmm. hope I'm not <laughs> no, no, no. But I really want, and I want this community and I want your platform, your listeners to understand that this is, this is going to take all of us. And if those parents that, that, that were dealing with the gangs, they didn't know, you know, they didn't have the answers to, to, to say, okay, what do I do? But there is another parent out there that said, I did this. Mm -hmm. Or there's another person, uh, it could be a grandmother who said, I did this, yeah. this make help. So those are the type of things that we're trying to create now. And that just to, to help our parents. I'm on this quest now that it's all about helping the family and the mm -hmm. parents, number one. I want to build, what my thing is right now, I want to build parents, mentors to mentor each other. If you've had a child that was in the detention center and then you, 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 you had to go through the system, you had to go through yeah. the system. How can you, can you come alongside us to help another parent? It may not be anything, but a, a phone call at late at night, hey, they got my child, what do I do? Yeah. You know, I've never been this before. I've been in this before. Who, who can I call? I just think those type of things and resources are, are, are more viable than me trying to get a program together. But if I found somebody who, can, who has been through this and, and can do life with me, I think yeah. to me, that's better than trying to create any program with any money, funds, from anywhere else that would be more sustainable in the long run. Yeah, I love that. I mean, we, if you think about other 
other um, systems, we do it with with AA, where you have a sponsor, somebody you can call and say, "Hey, I'm I'm having this issue right now. Help me." We we do it. We pair um, students with mentors who can say, "This is how I you know walk this path." So why not create something within the juvenile justice system that helps parents mm -hmm. um, navigate the system? Because otherwise, I mean. Part, a, a lot of the issues for me is sounds like we we just don't know what we don't know right. and especially if it's the first time you're going through it you don't know what questions to ask you don't know what numbers to call and so you just go through the system you just get funneled through uh -huh. and then your kids just get what they get and then you just are on the other side dealing with it not not having any kind of of help or so it's just it's just frustrating, but so I love that as a as a remedy for these families. Mm -hmm. So yeah, exactly. So we it sounds like with the wraparound approach, we definitely moved from it just being a buzzword, and I love that yeah. because mm -hmm. what we are notorious about is coming up with buzz Ooh, yeah. buzz stuff, right? <laughs> and that's all it that's all it is, right? So I love that. Um, well, when I think about the wraparound approach, and you you mentioned, you know, um, I want to say it was on the last show that you mentioned about, uh, no, you just said it a minute ago, having the, having the child at the table, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So I've heard of instances and just hearing people talking, don't know, you know, how accurate the information is about, you know, kids not being allowed to, it may have been in a, a divorce situation or whatever. Like I'm trying to figure out when are the judges not listening to the child or will they all, are, are they always open to listening to the child? Like, is there some type of, you know, age limit? Like, well, mm -hmm. we won't talk to a child because this child is six years old. We don't really, you know what I'm saying? We can't listen yeah. to what a six-year-old says, but if they're 13, yeah. you know, you know, are, are there yeah. limitations on when a child can be heard? Well, you, well as it, in, in court hearings, you would probably never hear the child per se because they have to talk okay. to their attorney. So that wouldn't be that wouldn't be the what that wouldn't be the time. But the attorney can work with the attorney and the probation officers. Everybody can work with their child. Uh, as far as the child is talking in court on on, on those. Uh, uh, particular cases uh, now in custom visitation, you may have, you know, judges may ask the child where you want to live and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. But as far as like in, in, when it comes to a detention setting or something like that, they're not, they, they have to just speak through their, their attorneys have to speak for them. Okay. Okay. But, but as we create, as we, meaning as like myself, as being coordinators, probationers, um, you know, uh, those in the community, we have all opportunity to speak with you. You know, you have youth all around us all the time. Those are coming in to hear uh, to, from in and out of the, the the detention center, or we have those that are just on probation. We mm -hmm. have we they're all around us. There's, there shouldn't be a time that we that we don't, we should have more uh, groups of youth that are if it's just their own advocacy or their counsel that mm -hmm. they have and they're talking. You know, there's so many have came out that has been successful. We should have more of them that's speaking. You know, uh -huh. it shouldn't be all about the adults when it comes to the youth. It should be about the youth. Now we can come alongside of them, but they should be leading this mm -hmm. and telling us. And, and we don't have enough of that to, to ensure. Because then we won't have to worry about the judges speaking, speaking to them because we'll have the programs all lined up. Right. So when the judge have to make that ruling, well, he already knows what's, what's going to be helpful, what's going to help this child or this particular, uh, in this particular instance, because he has it, he, he's getting it from, you know, the, the, the horse's mouth as, as we say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you, when we think about the lived experience and, you know, when he said partnering families, uh, and I, I think that's such, such a creative idea, like to partner the families, right? And, mm -hmm. um, but can you see that as a reality? When you really think about wraparound and what it should look like, mm -hmm. like can you really see futuristically everybody that should be at the table? Because I know 
who's at the table is going to be customized, right? Depending on the situations or whatever. Yeah. But yeah. is that a reality, you know, in this political Silo world that we live in? We live in the and, poli and politicized world that we live in, yeah. right? You know, because yeah. it, it could be, it's possible, but is it yeah. probable? Well, I, I definitely, I definitely can see it because it, it's happening. There, there's nothing new under the sun. Like mm -hmm. I said, juvenile court here in Shelby County is a JDA site, and there's 300 other sites uh, around. So there's, there's already, it's already happening. It's just about how do we, if we are we going to put enough resource, take resources from other places to make the resource happen here. And that's what we need to start looking at, reallocating some of our resources that we're utilizing to build uh, prisons or whatever the case may be. And so we can take that money and then we put into our youth and we put into the resources that we need because it would, it, with everything, if you if you really put some resources into things, you're gonna get what you need to get out of. Even with the, just say the parent, the parent mentor. We tell the parents that are mentor another parent, hey, we're gonna give you a stipend of yes. Five, you know, I didn't want to say month. that. I didn't want to bring up stipends, but but I there you but go. You, yeah, you do. You give them some money. Hey, they can go to a a Grizzlies game together, right. or mm -hmm. they can do life together. They can go to a coffee shop together. Whatever the case may be. But I still think resources are necessary for anything. But a lot of times here, what I find, everybody wants you to start off with. Let's do it free first, and then we'll see. But mm -hmm. why? Why do we have to do it free? You don't. You don't do everything else free. You know. Right. You, you You're not building those jails for free. No. That so you mentioned. The, <laughs> and so that's. What I'm saying the the biggest thing is reallocating funds. If we can do that, and we can work together on on that. You know, as a community, as leaders here, and everything. I think we could get more things, but that's what's not happening here. Look around the nation. You have so the other juvenile sites and, and the programs that they have. You got some of the facilities are at ground zero. They don't have any kids in there because they do, they do so much outside of the facility to help the youth. Wow. And that's what I think we need to get to. Yeah. yeah. Well, I hope, I really and truly hope that that's where we're moving to. Because mm -hmm. I, regardless of what it looks like, I still have a lot of hope, you know, mm -hmm for our children, you know, and, I, and they are our future. And so we should want to um, insert whatever resources we have, like, right, to, to, to make life better for our children. And they're gonna in turn and make life better for us. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're at break. We'll be right back on 94.7 FM. And we're back on 94.7 FM. I'm here with my co-host, Dr. Nicole West, and with Ms. Kimbrell Owens. We're still talking about our youth. This is part two of a series that we started on last week, and we are grateful that she's here to share this time with us uh, and just talk about our youth and our families and our holistic approach to uh, addressing the deficiencies that we see with our youth. Yeah. Miss, Miss Kimbrell, I'm wondering, you know, we talk about bringing the whole family to the table and then bringing all of their um, strengths, their resources to the table, kind of take an inventory of, uh -huh. of what the family has and what their needs are. And so I'm wondering, what, what do you say to a parent who is al already has a child in, in the system? Um, versus what do you say to a parent who believes that their child might be, you know, Ugh. quote, at risk for entering the system? Is, is that a different? Is there a different approach there? And can you talk a little uh, bit about, about that? We, we have so many calls every day of youth that have not committed a crime, but their parents mm -hmm. know that it's, it's about to occur. Even mm -hmm. if it's just from they may be thinking that they're, you know, gang, you know, affiliated, or yeah. you may have a young lady who's, you know, staying with a young man and she trying to get them out of, you know, it's, it's, I mean, we have so many, and they just won't help. Yeah. They don't, that hasn't committed a crime per se that, you know, we have to step in on. Mm -hmm. So 
when they're already in the facility, we know what their charge is. We know what, what may have, you know, what, what may have to happen with their child. We know there's attorneys in place. You know, we already know what's going on with that, that particular family. So we make it work it, work it a little bit better because a lot of people are dealing with that particular, but on the ones that are not in the system at all, mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. do have a person here that we, and we, uh, with a lot of our parents, um, her call and she's very good. Her name is, um, Miss Barbara Jackson. And then she just deals with those unruly kids at this. Some of them have been in the system, some not. And so she'll just kind of talk to them. And she has, she, she deals with them in on a resources basis too. But she's mm -hmm. dealt with it so long and, and to just try to see what what they're needed, what's needed for that particular child. But it is different. Mm -hmm. It is totally different what you say to them because they're needing the ones that had hit the system. They they really are almost in a plea begging state. Mm -hmm. I had a young lady call me a mom to come. She had two sons, and she worked. She worked at night, and she started recognizing that they were jumping out of the window and leaving. And she didn't mm -hmm. know what was happening. She was just, I mean, she had tried all, everything she knew. I mean, she was just, I mean, she had called her pa pastor. She had called friends. She had, I mean, everything she knew. And she just was like, what can I do? I'm, you know, they had committed a crime, but I know they're doing something out there and I can't be around them 24 yeah. seven. And those are the ones that we have to truly try every resource we can to keep that keep those youth from getting into the system. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's mentoring. Sometimes it's getting law enforcement involved just to talk to the child, just to see mm -hmm. what's going on. And because it starts getting into, into that, that gray area. And to add to that, another thing is we, we start recognizing, and I, and I know this not off topic, but on top a little bit, is that a lot of our youth started, when they start messing with or uh, smoking marijuana at an early age, is it's start now start stemming into us knowing now that we have to deal with them differently because they are a little more aggressive. They, they're, they don't, they don't rationale well. Um, they're in, and so now we're dealing with it. Cause when parents start telling us when well, he's been, we know he's smoking weed and all of that. And we start seeing now mental illnesses are coming into play mm -hmm. later on. And we're in, and so now that's one thing that's coming up. And so when these parents are talking, we ask them those kinds of, are they dealing with marijuana? Do you know? Um, so we ask them these kind of questions. So it just comes back to in your question. I know I'm all over the place, but the question really and truly to answer is about parents is that it's, it's hard. Mm -hmm. It's hard because there's nothing you can give someone that, that to answer all their questions and to help them. You can't yeah. go in the home. You can't take the kid away. All you can do is try to give them the resources that you have that's, that, that's are available. And the most of them are scared that they're going to have to get a, get that call that their child is deceased mm -hmm. or in the, in, you know, in a juvenile dis detention center, you know? And so it is, it's two different ways you talk to them. And what do you say to them? Sometimes it's just on a case by case basis to see what's going on. Right. I think I think I hear you speaking to the the bigger issue of you know, and this happens probably with a lot of our systems, but that that idea of waiting until something happens for us to intervene. Um and I I just it 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 just bothers me that we have to that we why not be more proactive, right? Like <laughs> Is it because there's there's no mo money in prevention or is it because there's more money on the other side of this? I mean, it just seems like with a lot of our systems, we are just in this holding pattern of waiting for something to happen before we put something into place. And the marijuana yeah. thing, I, the marijuana thing, I, that's so unfortunate because what I'm, what I'm saying with you at risk you is that because of how it's been portrayed in the media, even being legalized in some states, mm -hmm. it's now being seen as something so minute. Mm -hmm. When just like anything else that we put in our bodies, right? Um, you know, maybe you can go and have a glass of wine and you can just function just fine and be okay. And I have one and I might be, you know, hanging from the rooftop or something. Mm -hmm. Things That's impact true. everybody differently, right? And so the kids have, our, our kids, and not, of course, not as a whole, but have decided that, oh, y'all have made a big deal out of this all these years, right? And it really mm -hmm. wasn't a big deal after all. Now, the other end of the spectrum is, some folks that have done some hard time 
for something that they have now legalized, you know, so right. like all these yeah. different places on the spectrum that you can talk about it. But I know that marijuana is having a negative impact on our children and their mental Absolutely. health and how they function. Yeah. Yeah. And Dr. West, you said something that was that was really, really profound when you came when you when you stated about when did something happen, and I think that's mm-hmm. really where we are. Mm-hmm. We really are where we are. I mean, I work with law enforcement a lot, and I and I have to say I really have to give it up to the law enforcement here in Memphis is that our, the Memphis Police Department and our Sheriff's Department, honestly, when we the different um, uh, the, the different uh, committees that I'm on with them, they really do want to help. They do, mm-hmm. they do not want to, if necessary, bring them to mm-hmm. the detention center at all possible. But their biggest thing with us is saying is, what do I do? Mm-hmm. I cannot allow you just to be out here and not do anything. So give me, I mean, I'm telling you, they're almost at a point of begging and pleading. Give me something else to do with these. You know, I don't want yeah. to bring them. Yeah, their hands are tied. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. yes. So what do we do? And so we're looking at the police because we're like, okay, you don't have to arrest me. They're like, okay, so give me something else to do. Yeah. You know. And so yes, preventive measures are this back to what you guys said that somebody really needs to tap into that re-entry and those preventive measures, if if at all possible, we can find those solutions to help to get some awesome results. I think we would be in a better place. Um, you know. And what we do with our youth or anybody that, you know, is, is at risk for, you know, when we work with them, it should be about building that resiliency, right? And so how, how are we, how are you guys able to do that with these families in this wraparound setting and approach that we have? You know, how are you, what kinds of things are you doing, you know, where you're looking to build resiliency? Because I, I, I know one of the things I had somebody work in a program for me once and this person was really good at what they did, but they were more about, you know, holding hands, you know, holding their hands and, you know, but you want to build that resiliency and you want to, you want to push them towards independence and being able to function in society, right, you know, on yeah. their own. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah the, the biggest thing is uh, that we're trying to do that I'm not saying we do the best at, but just trying to make sure they have the, the resources that they need. And, mm-hmm. and I'm not saying that it is the, the best thing, but really, you know, because the only thing you can do is seeing what's out there, what's available and what can they do, you know, because mm-hmm. if they want it, they'll do it. You know, if you put them in the right spot, you know, you, but you have to want it too, you know. And so I, you're right. You could try, I could try to go and walk everybody to the facility or to the agency or to help, but you, you you can't you can't walk everybody to it so it has to be those things in place and they usually what i see when the help it, the, the help becomes to a point where they are really wanting it is when they ask for it mm-hmm. if they're asking for it, and, and then they will try it now sometimes mm-hmm. youth are just so far gone that they just you know it, it, it helps and sometimes it doesn't but and i won't say so far gone that's not the right term i really want to say but i'm just saying to a point that they're kind of um pushing against it you yeah, know, if they, you know, they don't feel like they need it uh, is necessary at the time. But I think if we we do get what we have available, if they call, we, we know we're going to try to give them as much as we can that we know of. But what has happened with us in juvenile court is everybody started looking to us and we were not built for, <laughs> the court was never built for us to try to, you know, be preventive per se. We just usually handle what comes in our door and then we can right. do it from there. But right. at this point in time, now at a state where we have to help we can't we're, we're the door that everybody looks to so it's now you you see the kim Brails and the the dr williams and the yeah. our trauma and we do have a trauma specialist here our court saw that we needed one her name is dr elian audrey elian now i wish yes. she could have came on the day but it's short notice to get her on too but she is phenomenal she goes into the school system she goes mm-hmm. into you know the law enforcement trying to get them trauma informed and mm-hmm. things that I meant to tell you guys that um, before, but just trying to get uh, as much as possible from inside the court to the outside, because for many years, people hated juvenile court because they felt that all we did was put the hammer down and bring the kids in, and that was all we did, but, you know, for a long time, we had resources, we had things here, but it just wasn't outshadowing all the negative that was seen from the outside, so we do have things, and we do try to help the parents. We can't hold their hand, but we give them what we have. Mm-hmm. Who who might be part of the typical, if there is one, um, the typical wraparound team? 
and I know that that probably looks very different for each family, but outside of the child and the family being there, who, who might be some other typical players? You're going to have some, some, you, it depends on if they have any mental illnesses or things of that nature. So you may have, uh, you may have some counselors at the table. You may have a probation officer, of course, you're going to have the attorneys. Uh, you may have the prosecutor there. You may have our expediter there possibly, and you may have a judge or a magistrate in, in, in there too, because sometimes you, you have to, uh, you have to bring everybody in to kind of look at that. Sometimes everybody may not give their input, but they may be able to, you know, see what's necessary, what's needed, so that if anything happens on the back end, they can be able to assist. Mm -hmm. And those are the people that might say, you know, here's a plan. This is what might be helpful for this family or this child. Maybe after school programs or some sort of employment, you know, readiness training or um, exactly linking them to different resources in the community that they may not otherwise know exist. Exactly, exactly, okay. exactly. I, and I'll say most of the times our um, uh, PD department for our, now they, they don't work in this building, but they work hand in hand with us, our public defender's office. I have to say they work really good at putting plans together. They have, they even uh, re, as of recently, maybe in the last year or two, they've came up with a social worker in their office because they saw that they needed more than just trying to say, um, what the kid needed or looking for resources, but they needed somebody in-house that was always on board of trying to figure things out. And so that when they, the child made it to court or whatever the case may be, they would have a plan already in place, you know, and they could be, they have the resources available. So they work hand in hand with us for a lot of things. They'll call up, see what we have. And, but they, they put together a really good uh, plan for these youth so that by the time they get to court, the judge say, well, what you got? And the, the defense attorney or the, the public defender uh, would say, hey, we already got this in place. We know that the uh, he's going to be at the uh, past at his pastor's uh, church on this day. Hey, they, they got a neighbor who's going to pick them up. You know, it's, it's those type of things. But you have to have that. Everybody don't go that deep, uh, yeah. but a lot of people do. And our families usually receptive. I mean, is everybody does everybody come to the table in a, with an open mind, right? Because I, I know you might have some, I could see having some parents that feel like y'all are way too much in our business, right? We, you know how we sometimes have that. Or have that there's fear. nothing wrong with my child. Y'all just right. speaking on my child. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it sounds like like a great program, but but do you get any kind of resistance from, from of people? Okay. Of course, whatever, with everything we do, nobody's always going to be uh, on board because you're right. You get, you, you have sometimes I've, I've uh, been around uh, some of the, the, uh, the uh, sessions where the parents will come in, they're talking and, and at this point, and they're trying to act as if they got everything together and everything, yeah. you know, they don't need to be there, but your child is before us. So there's some problem. <laughs> so mm -hmm. yeah, we have pushback, um, but when they're wanting to get out, and get away from us or get away from detention. Oh, they are bought in. <laughs> what do you need? Who you need me to find? I can find a coach. <laughs> look, he used to play PV football or look, she was she was a skater back when she was, you know, they are fine, you know, what's necessary they need. Mm -hmm. And when they when they start doing that, it lets you know that they do care. You know, they do care enough to try to help get their you, you know, child um uh, some uh, some help and to get them away from other uh, systems. Mm -hmm. Cultural competence is another buzz phrase or word. Mm -hmm. uh, would you say that you, you guys are culturally competent in the work that you do? Well, I would say yes. We do have what we call here a DMC or a uh, racial and ethnic disparity uh, coordinator <laughs> here. Her name is mm -hmm. uh, Liesta Redmond. -Trail. And uh, we've always had a DMC coordinator or it's, 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 that's the person who deals with our racial um, mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they kind of look at all our cases and who's in detention, who's been detention for a while and see, you know, what, what kind of dispar disparity is happening? You know, is it more whites than black? Is it blacks and whites and things of that nature and see what we can do. Now, don't get me wrong that we can only deal with what we get. So a lot of it is, you know, yeah. having to deal with law enforcement because what's yeah. brought in is what brought in can't do anything about them. But what we can do is try to see what we can do. Uh, mm -hmm. Because we having more, you know, African-American youth coming in based off, you know, uh, our white youth and our counterparts, then what do we 
you know, what's happening and how do we, you know, how can we fix this? And sometimes we can't because, you know, the crimes are being committed, but we do have, we have to look at it from that angle. Sometimes there's nothing we can do about it, but we have to always have it on the table. We cannot, mm-hmm. we, we can't just walk and not talk about it. We mm-hmm. can't, and a lot of it is training. Because even those that work in this, this walk of life, and most of the youth could be uh, African-American, just like those that are working in it, sometimes they're not culturally sensitive. You know, sometimes they are a little harder on, they may look at a, we had some some people were looking at zip codes, like, oh, you're in 38127, we know this going to be a So we had to work with those. It's been a while, but we are all, you know, now on the same uh, playing field. But, you know, people are doing that, you know, so that's a part of, you know, being culturally sensitive about certain things and also being aware of, you know, just not looking at everything from, from color. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I know that you are part of the juvenile detention board. Um, I want to, I want us to talk about that, the kinds of folks that come together and why, and you know, what that looks like and how effective that's been. We're gonna talk about that when we come back from break on 94.7 FM. And we're back on 94.7 FM. I'm just looking at my co-host saying if she's gonna say anything, <laughs> we are back. We are still here with Ms. Kimbrell Owens and we are talking about uh, the juvenile justice system and all things uh, that it encompasses. And we really wanted to focus on, on um, the holistic approach to addressing issues with our juvenile justice system, uh, talking about the families, uh, the systems of care, our wraparound services and approaches, approaches to uh, our juvenile justice system. Um, I asked before break if you would talk about the juvenile detention board, and we, you and I, are on a couple of things together. Um, mm-hmm. Just talk about that, and I think that will shed some light with you know with our audience about the kinds of things that we do, you know, to approach addressing any any issues that we have. Okay, sure. Um, yes, we do have several boards, and um, our juvenile detention, uh, our JDI board, we have, we have that board, and we have a, a juvenile justice board as well, too. Uh, but both of them are made up of law enforcement, um, school officials. Uh, we have, um, uh, well, who else we have? We have um, different agencies from the um, Chevy County, Chevy County um, government. School, school systems. Uh, mm-hmm. School systems. We have, um, let me look at, let me look, I was looking at my list. Uh, yeah. Uh, we have the boys. And, we have the boys and girls club. Yeah. Um, we also have uh, U, um, UT. Mm-hmm. Um, the health services. Uh, we have Department of Children's Services. We have Department of uh, Human Services. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do we have? We have our um, Latino community that is representative. Mm-hmm. Um, we have the day's office. We have a mixture of. We have those that come from out of town. Um, we have um, that do the same work that helps us um, to understand that other agencies around the world and then to give us um, some kind of a consultant that kind of consult with us as well. And so what well, we that do- That part right the, there, Kimbrell, will you, will you talk just to expand on that part, the person that comes in, you know, to from consult. Out of, uh-huh, to consult. Will you expand on that and like why we do that piece? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the consulting part is very important because number one, we don't know everything. And mm-hmm. as even if we're, even though we're coming together and we're trying to be like-minded as, as far as trying to create things and, and develop resources for our youth, we still need someone who has been in the trenches, has done it before, and to give us a, a different angle on things because they can see things from the outside that we can't see. Sometimes living into a community, we only see the community. But if you can look from the outside, from the outside in uh, sometimes to help us is awesome. And usually what our consultant do is they take our data. They take data and look at it and say, hey, you guys, just like we're talking today, you guys have brought out that we may need to kind of look at re-entry or looking at parents and things like that. They do the same thing. They say, hey, you can't do it all. But looking at your data, you have youth that are doing this. So you got youth that are uh, uh, one big thing that our consultant first came in uh, probably in 2011, 2012, start helping us. 
he stated to us that you guys are having a problem with domestic assault charges. He said, have you guys noticed that? Now, mind, mind you, we saw the data, but we never, we didn't, we didn't pull it out. Like we didn't know it was a low hanging fruit that we needed to deal with. So early on, what we did with it, once he said that to us, it was like, oh, we never looked at data like that because that's not mm -hmm. one thing that we did. And so we started early on, we, we decided that we needed to come up with something to, because those youth didn't need to be in detention. So we came up with working with youth villages and working with Port Ali uh, to say, if we can have some kind of site that is a cooling off spot. Because what was occurring was those those kids that were uh, committing uh, domestic assault charges, usually was with a parent, they could have threw, threw a remote or they were fighting a sibling or whatever. And the parent was like, look, I'm calling the police on you. I got to get you yeah. out. And that's and we always tell parents we you know we, we don't advise that but we understand that this your home you have to do what you feel is best. But what we did was we were able to develop a um, resource with Port Leaf and with youth villages where they had bed they could stay overnight and just you know it's cool and off spot you know because mm -hmm. usually parents the next day the parents are, are better they're okay and they're like okay we're good you know the child mm -hmm. is better. And so they had a spot for that. So that's kind of like what the consultant did, always looking at things that we weren't looking at and to give us a guidance and to help guide us into creating things that we, we needed. Sometimes we know it and sometimes we don't. So that's how we utilize our consultant with our different boards. And our boards are very instrumental in everything you see that are happening, that we've created inside and outside the court that we're a part of, they have been a part of. They came out with it. We may have came, the idea may have been sparked in a meeting, but then you may have Rhonda who will say, well, I know a resource over here. You may have Dr. West on this side and say, well, I know of this over here. And then we all come, to back, come together collectively and say, okay, well, how can we get some resources somewhere? Can we work with the mayor? Can we work with the uh, county commissioners or the counselor, Memphis counselors to see uh, what we can do to make this happen? So that's why these boards are so important. We have an array of people that are in the room uh, from different walks of uh, representation of the uh, uh, some some in juvenile justice, some not, but they are all about, you know, creating those things that are necessary for our youth. Yeah. You discussed, um, I think we, you brought up earlier about suspensions and, and expulsions um, and that kind of being a, a revolving door um, for some, some of our youth. And so I'm just wondering with you guys partnering with Shelby County Schools and, and all of these other you know, really um, good resources in our community. Is there, is there any talk or, or has there been anything um, in place to either decrease the number of suspensions or expulsions that kids, that kids experience or, because um, when, I, when I think about it, you know, and I used to work in a school and so I have seen multiple kids get suspended three, four, five times a year, right? And then they come back and magically they're just supposed to be, you know, this perfect student. But we mm -hmm. haven't done anything in the interim. We just mm -hmm. sent them home mm -hmm. and we haven't taught them any skills. We haven't given them anything that they needed. They just come back to school and magically they're supposed to be better. So this may not be something that, that the juvenile justice system really can, can address, but I'm just wondering since you guys have these partnerships, um, if, if there's any talk about providing we have, some, go we ahead. Have. We have, yeah. um, before COVID, and it may have been in maybe 18, it could have been 2018, uh, the uh, Shelby County uh, superintendent at the time, Shelby County School superintendent at the time was really truly wanting to get a, um, a, a sort of like a board, I want to say a board, maybe like a, a focus group or something. And they want to just deal with that expulsion. What can we do? Because they really was trying to figure out, like, because they saw it happening too. And they knew that wasn't the answer. So we started working together. Uh, we had uh, representation from juvenile court and uh, school system and other, other agencies as well. And we were all just trying to come up with ideas. Now, I don't know what ever happened with it because it seemed like it kind of fell off as it kind of went, but it was, it was, it was rolling really well. And, the, and, and what we found out is, who was having the, the worst time with this, of really not working with this um, different, uh, this group of people and, and trying to come up with uh, avenues of not uh, uh, expelling kids was the principals and teachers. Those that were in the room, the, because of course they are hands-on, you know, they have to yeah. see them every day, they have to deal with them. So we, we got it. So we, we always were in a battle because they didn't see, if the kid acts up, I gotta get them out of here because yeah. you got, 25 others that's doing right, but you got this mm -hmm. one 
And so they didn't see it. So our thing was trying to work with them to say, okay, yeah, they may be, they may need to get out the class. I'm not saying they don't. Okay, but what can we do to keep them at school? Mm-hmm. Because because out of school was not helping either. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and you spell a kid for 180 days or whatever the case may be, and you you're right. You think they're gonna come back and, and fold their fold their hands in their lap right. and just that's not it, it never happens. Right. That's why we had that's why we, we we tried to work with alternative schools to see what they were doing as the kids were you know re-entering back into their normal school things of that nature. Uh, I, we have Hope Academy here um, in our detention center. That's our Shelby County School is inside the detention center. So when a kid is in detention, they still go to school just like they would if they were mm-hmm. outside. And so we try to work with that, but it, it's hard because you have so much pushback. But I think that's one of those things like we were saying, saying trauma informed. I think it needs to be expulsion exp- informed or something for the teachers yeah. to say, we need to find other avenues to try to keep them in school. Mm-hmm. And that was hard. So yes, we worked with them and we've talked about it. And uh, we tried to push back as a court to say, we're not taking everything. That's why SHAPE, the program that she talked about earlier, uh, SHAPE was, was, was great because you had certain offenses. If they, if they committed those offenses, they didn't make it to us at all. They went into this program at the schools. If the schools had that particular uh, SHAPE, uh, it was a, if it was a SHAPE school. Mm-hmm. So, um, so there was something in place that was kind of assisting, but we needed more. That's all. And we, we, need, we needed more. And, and an extension of that, when you, you know, when you talk about, you just, because what I do know is kids love to get a day, some days out of school. <laughs> so mm-hmm. there has to be yeah. something done in the <laughs> interval. But, you know, we also have this goal and I, and I kind of under, I understand it, you know, wanting to keep the child in the home, right? We want to keep the child with their parents if, if at all possible, right? Mm-hmm. But back to what you've been talking about all along, if we're not working with these families, mm-hmm. if, we're, if we're not using these wraparound approaches and holistically addressing the problem, then it's defeating the whole purpose to right. just keep the child with their mom and dad. But there are some, there are some things going on that mm-hmm. need addressed. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's the same way, I think, when, when we think about suspension and expulsion, you know, you're, you're sending the kid out of the academic environment into one that's not supposed to be, it's not intended to be an academic environment. You're sending them home. And so uh-huh. eventually they get behind and, and then when they come back, they're maybe bullied for, for being even more behind than they were when they left. And so maybe they end up dropping out of school because this is too much and and then they need money. So they're living a life of crime. I mean, it's just a snowball effect. Now of- you really want to talk about a ripple effect. And then you got teachers that are being held accountable for a child in their classroom that's behind and it's mm-hmm. no fault of theirs. It does mm-hmm. not speak to their ability to teach or not teach, mm-hmm. but yet, it goes against them in their evaluation process. I'm telling you, it is a true ripple effect. Thus, the yeah. reason it is so critical that we, we do bring all the key players to the table mm-hmm. to have these discussions, right? Because somebody mm-hmm. in law enforcement may not even think about how it may mm-hmm. impact the classroom setting mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and vice versa. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. So is there any yeah. more is there any more that we can, you know, when we're talking about holistic um approaches, is there any more that, you know, if somebody's listening right now, maybe they're a police officer or a teacher or a neighbor, um, a community leader, is there any more that we can do that maybe we're not doing? Um police officers, for example. You know, they, they are in our communities a lot and they know our kids or they know our families, or maybe they don't, mm-hmm. um, maybe some of them do. I have a, I have a friend who is a police officer. He is very involved in the community that, that he is in. He knows the kids' names, he knows their parents, but not all, not all officers, you know, operate that way. So I guess I'm just wondering like, what else can we as a, as the people in the community um, what else can we do? I think last show you were saying 
it's it's up to all of us. Yeah. So what else can we do really to support that maybe we're not yet practicing? I, um, one big thing, like I said earlier, is in, I don't know if it was on this show, but um, is, is looking at what we do with our funds. You know, looking at what others are doing with their youth in other cities that are that is that is working. It's and working. not so much as you, but that's working, you know, mm-hmm. that is keeping, you know, if you go to a, if we look at different places and we have uh, the, their detention centers or their numbers of youth crime is down, let's talk to them. Let's see what we're doing. Let's see what they're doing. Talk to the families. Um, I think with law enforcement, I think- And let's be willing are, to share. And let's be willing, willing to share. Listen. And listen. Yeah. Willing to share and listen. Just because we're on different sides of the track doesn't mean that we can't listen and glean from each other because that's what we're not doing. I don't know everything and I won't ever act as if I do. I mean, you guys have taught me a lot on the show today. Just different questions you've asked that made me just think about, you know, it's so much other stuff there, things that I definitely probably need to, to sink my teeth into. But I think to, to answer your question is we have to start doing. Stop all the talking, but start doing mm-hmm. I mean, it is just like the Nike Nike logo and slogan is just do it. Just we can try it. something. One thing right. about that we don't yeah. do enough, but we don't try things. Let's just try it. You know, if there's an mm-hmm. idea left there on the table, let's just try it. And and we move on. We can tr- and, and work together. Let's mm-hmm. work together. Yeah. Are are there are there final thoughts that you would want to share with our listening audience before we come to a close. We have got about two minutes. Well, first, let me thank you, ladies, because you have been amazing. This show is amazing. You two are amazing. I mean, doc to doc, I promise you, this is the platform uh, that I am going to be pushing. But to answer your question, I want all your listeners to understand that there are people out here willing and able and want to help. So, um, hey, in the chat or uh, wherever uh, places are where you are right now, hey, reach out, say what's necessary, say that you know that will work or what, what you need or what's necessary. Um, my biggest thing this year is going to be, like I said, it's going to be about parents trying to have forums, trying to have resource uh, platforms to try to help but I need to know what's necessary. I need to know what, what's needed. So I'm just going to be out there in the trenches just trying to see what I can do to assist in utilizing all those people that are reaching out to me. So uh, my biggest thing with everyone is to know the youth are youth. They, their mindsets are not like ours, that mm-hmm. they are, you know, they will do things that are going to get them in trouble and treat them as such. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's going to be time going to have to do a little bit more than that but understand they too need a hug they too need to uh, someone to listen and to say i care and sometimes that's all that matters that law enforcement agents that come in contact with them have a conversation with them you know that community leader have a conversation with them so we can all do this walk together and let's do it together uh let's let's try if all possible to help a youth along the way yeah thank thank you for the we, we thank you again for the work that you do and yeah. for all the people there um, at, at the courts that do this work and that are really uh, in the trenches all the time with our youth and trying to make things better, we appreciate you guys. Uh, as you know, uh, our listening audience, we, you know, we air every Saturday, but we'll also upload our shows to uh, the Doctor the Doctor in the chat room Facebook page. So you can go there if you have any ideas as you listen you know, just leave us a little note and we will share those ideas with, uh, with Kim Braille. Um, and, and she can share them with all the different people that key stakeholders that she comes to the table with on a regular basis. But in the meantime, we hope that you guys will be back next Saturday, same chat channel, same chat time with Dr. Nicole West and I here and Dr. the doctor in the chat room. We will see you then.